Okay, um, go ahead and get started today. This, today's lecture will be um, part two of the evolution of sex. Um, I think that'll just about get through that part, and then we can go on. Um, last time we were talking about um, ideas of why sex had evolved and was being maintained. And I gave you a number of competing hypotheses uh, which could explain the evolution and maintenance of sex. None of them are completely satisfactory. They are not mutually uh, exclusive. And I should point out that some of these hypotheses, such as the, the purging of deleterious alleles and the uh, repair of DNA might be particularly important in how sex got started. Um, and others of the ideas, uh, such as the Bell hypothesis, might be more important with respect to the maintenance of sex and why it is that once we got a sexual system, uh, it's very unlikely that it will evolve into an asexual one. Okay. Um, today we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask a different set of questions. And the, the first question I want to ask is a, a very fundamental one, and that is why are there males and females? Why are there two sexes rather than three sexes or seven sexes or as occur in some uh, protozoans like paramecium, 14 sexes. When we look across the animal and plant kingdoms, by and large, and particularly in metazoans, what we find over and over again is two sexes, what we call male and female. So the first question I have for you is, what's the difference? What's a male and what's a female? Yeah, you got that too fast. Usually people talk about beards and horns and vaginas and penises and all this other stuff. Um, and yeah, the, the important thing is not the primary genitalia or the secondary sexual characteristics that we see in, in many males and females. It's really the fundamental difference between a male and a female is the size of the gametes. Females produce large, nutrient-rich, immobile eggs, and males produce tiny, usually, um, fast-swimming sperm, which are good at seeking out and fertilizing eggs. Okay. A sperm is really nothing more than a package of DNA, a motor to propel it, and a little cap of enzymes to help it to fertilize, to penetrate the egg and fertilize it. Okay. So the question which biologists have been asking themselves for a long time is why has over and over again there been the evolution of eggs, big nutrient-rich immobile gametes, and sperm, little fast-swimming pieces of DNA with a motor. The first person to really work through a, a good model of the evolution of eggs and sperm was Jeff Parker. And his ideas were elaborated by Baker and John Maynard Smith, but Parker generally gets credit for this. This is work, theoretical work that was done in the 70s and early 80s. Parker noted that there are particularly single-celled organisms which produce gametes, haploid gametes, that are the same size and which fuse in... Uh, a sexual manner to produce a zygote. And this situation is called isogamy. And 
which means simply same size isogamy gametes. So there are isogamous species, but by and large they occur in, in single-celled organisms. The situation that's more common, which we described as having big eggs and small sperms, is called anisogamy. which basically just means unequal size gametes. So Parker is trying to figure out how it is that we're going to explain the evolution of anisogamy. And he basically works out initially a word model. Uh, uh, later, this was formalized into a mathematical treatment model, but I'll just give you the word model that he, he first came up with. Let's assume that we have an isogamous species uh, but there's some heritable variation in the size of the gametes. Some of them are a little bit bigger, some of them are a little bit smaller, and that size difference has a heritable component. Let's also assume that the larger, larger zygotes that result from the fusing of gametes have a greater chance of surviving if they're bigger perhaps because they have more nutrient uh, that they can draw on to grow, perhaps because they have more nutrient which allows them to persist in the plankton longer. For some reason, bigger zygotes do slightly better than smaller ones. Okay. So if that's the case, larger gametes produce larger zygotes, but there's a problem. If you produce a larger gamete, you can also produce, probably all things being equal, fewer of them. There's only so much reproductive effort that's possible to an individual, and it can either cut that effort up into a few very large gametes or many smaller gametes. If the survivorship of larger gametes is sufficiently great to more than compensate for their re reduced numbers, they will be favored. Okay. So now we have big gametes that, when they fuse with other gametes, are greatly favored. They have higher fitness. And that more than compensates makes up for the fact that there are fewer of them. Now, there's, there will immediately, if that's the case, be selection for smaller gametes to find and fuse the big ones. Because if they fuse with sm other small ones, they're not going to have the nutrient reserves necessary to survive, and they'll be outcompeted by these big zygotes that are running around. Okay? The big gametes that make bigger zygotes should also try to reject fusing with smaller gametes uh, because that's going to decrease their fitness. But the effect will be not nearly as strong. Selection will be intense for a little one to find a big one because if it doesn't, it's out of the game. For a big one to fuse with a small one, it's a cost, but it may not be fatal. So this immediately sets up an inequality and the system is driven more and more for large gametes and small ones that are very, very good at finding and fusing with those big eggs, what we now call proto-eggs. Everybody with me to this point? Okay. That's basically the model. Um, Intermediates will lose out if you're a middle-sized gamete and you fuse with another middle-sized gamete, you're just not going to make it because by now we have these great big hulking eggs with lots of nutrient and little fast sperm that find them very quickly and fertilize them to produce viable zygotes. That model was um, pretty much accepted within five years of publication. Uh, and after a flurry of sort of cleaning up the, the fine points, 
uh, every textbook written in the evolution of sex since then has basically just regurgitated that model and said that's the way things are. In the last five years, there have been a number of attempts to go back and re-examine the model and look at alternative uh, hypotheses as to why you might have the evolution of, of big eggs and small sperm. Um, one idea that's commonly pops, well, the reason people are so interested in going back and, and re-examining this is there, there is a fundamental assumption that Parker made, which is not always true, or does not appear to be always true. And that is that big gametes are more fit and more than compensate for their lack of numbers. Okay? That assumption may be true, and it may be true in the beginning when gamete uh, sperm and eggs first evolved, but in several tests that have been done recently looking at existing species, it doesn't seem to be the case in every, in every single case. Anyway, so people are out there looking for alternative hypotheses, which is a good thing to do in science. It's good for us to every so often go back and recheck our thinking and make sure that we're right. One hypothesis which has been put forth recently is that big eggs um, are easier for sperm to find and fertilize. So there may be selection for being big because it's easier for another gamete then to run into you, to bump into you and fertilize you. Okay? A sort of a corollary of that argument, we know that in many species, eggs produce a pheromone, a chemical, uh, which sort of expands in a gradient around them. And that chemical helps sperm to home in and find and fertilize the eggs. Big eggs can probably produce more of this pheromone and then have a, a broader active space in which they can attract other gametes to come and fertilize them. It's another possibility. Um, another argument which looks more at sperm than at eggs is that there may actually be selection for sperm to shed their cytoplasm and in so doing get rid of symbionts and other extra chunks of DNA which have come into the system. Uh, and it's a way of, of having uniparental inheritance, which I won't go into the arguments, but that may also be favored. Um, none of these are very satisfactory but they may play some role. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me back up for a second. Eggs contain not only a bunch of nutrient, but they have a lot of cytoplasm that contains other organelles uh, uh, along with things like mitochondria, right? Uh, so the mitochondria that you get came from your mother and her mitochondria came from her mother, and in fact, we can follow mitochondria back to the dawn of humans, and it's been maternally inherited. Uh, you get basically nothing but DNA from the sperm, from the male. It, there's an argument that if both eggs and sperm were transmitting uh, these organelles, or um, infectious bits of DNA. It could set up a competitive situation which would be unstable. And the result is that the, a unilateral, a uniparental inheritance is evolutionarily more stable. So there's selection for just one set of cytoplasm to go forth, not both. That's as far as I want to go with it in this course. Okay, all right. All right. Um, the bottom line, 99.9% .9 certain that Parker is on the right track. Whether there are some other little tweaks that can be made to his theory uh, remain to be seen. But by and large, I fully predict that in another 40 years, the textbooks will still have <coughs> Jeff Parker and his idea of the evolution of anisogamy in it. Okay. 
Given anisogamy, given that we have an eggs and sperm, females become a scarce resource. And the reason for that is that an individual has only so many resources that it can put into producing gametes. And females have evolved to chop those gametes up into big pieces, or that, that reproductive effort into big pieces, produce a few very large eggs. Males, on the other hand, have gone the other route. They have produced lots and lots, millions or billions even, of sperm. And there are lots and lots of sperm to go around to fertilize those few eggs. So females can really increase their reproductive success primarily by making more eggs. They can't make smaller eggs. They have to be a certain size. So there's not really a lot they can do. They're pretty much stuck with what they've got. Males can increase their reproductive success by not by making more sperm. They've got all the sperm they could possibly use. They can re re increase their reproductive success by going out and finding more eggs, i.e. females, and fertilizing them. And it's this sort of inequality which is going to set up everything that we say for the next month about the evolution of mating systems, of uh, parental care, all sorts of different aspects of behavioral ecology. Let me give you uh, just one concrete example. Uh, females, humans, produce a few or have a few hundred eggs that they can ovulate in their lifetime. So depending on the number of pregnancies, uh, under usually under 100 eggs are ovulated in a lifetime by a female. Males produce 500 million sperm a day. So a five milliliters of ejaculate contains enough sperm to fertilize every egg, human egg on earth each day. Okay. Now obviously the males can't find all those females, but they can find some of them. <laughs> Um, so the females are pretty much stuck. The, the males increase their reproductive success by going out and finding more females. First, the argument holds not only for the actual number of gametes which are produced, but the argument also holds for the amount of extra effort which goes into to reproducing. So females are limited by the number of eggs they can produce, but they're further limited in, the, say, the case of humans by the maternal care which goes into those offspring. So she's, she can only produce a few eggs, and then she further takes herself out of the game by spending several months or even years taking care of that offspring. Bob Trivers, the name that we haven't talked about before, but he'll come up again and again, uh, a theoretical evolutionary biologist who uh, is now down at Santa Cruz, in the early 70s was the first person to really recognize the significance uh, of this. And I'll read you a quote. It's a bit obtuse. But basically, Trivers said that where one sex invests considerably more than the other, Members of the latter will compete among themselves to make members to mate with members of the former. Okay. So all, all Trivers is really saying is when one sex is limited by the amount of effort that it puts into reproducing, the non limiting sex will compete among themselves for access to the limiting sex. Okay. That statement Clear? Okay. I'm going to say it one more time in a different way. Um, basically, think of think of um, lifetime personal investment in, reprodu in reproducing. So, all that you can do in your lifetime to reproduce. And there are basically two ways that you can devote 
energy and effort into reproducing. Um, you can basically use what we call parental effort, which is the production of gametes and the care and nurturing of those gametes or resulting zygotes. Females typically put their effort into parental effort. So they're producing a few rich eggs and then taking care of those eggs. There are exceptions. Males put their effort into what we call mating effort, finding and mating with females. The sperm that that takes is trivial in terms of energy, usually. The energy that it takes in finding females and competing with other males for them is much more significant. So in general, all things being equal, Females go for parental effort. Males go for reproductive uh, mating effort. Okay. Um, it's a variation in lifetime reproductive success that's going to completely drive everything that I'm going to say about sexual selection, the evolution of mating systems, all those other reproductive wrinkles that we're going to talk about in the rest of the course. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples um, of what we mean by this. We're going to look at a couple species uh, in their reproduction. And this is going to be the maximum... offspring reproduced or produced in one lifetime. And we'll look at males and females. And so for our first species, let's look at uh, elephant seals. So if you go down to uh, Año Nuevo um, a couple months ago, or even now, you'll see the elephant seals hauling out. Uh, the males competing strongly uh, with one another to reproduce. So you get the big beach masters, giant males who are controlling harems of females that they can mate with. If we look at the maximum number of male of offspring produced or sired by a male in his lifetime, it's about. 200, okay? If you look at the maximum number of offspring produced by a female elephant seal in her lifetime, it's about 15, okay? We can do the same thing for humans. And for this, I had to go to an old copy that I have of Guinness Books of World Records. Um, you might want to look up the new record. I'm sure it's changed. But as of a few years ago, uh, the record held by a man was Muli Ishmael the Bloodthirsty. Uh, had a, presumably had a harem. Um, and he is, had documented 888 children. Okay? Um, there's good reason to believe. Remember we talked about Genghis Khan and how many of the Y chromosomes came in Asia from Genghis Khan? There's, there's good evidence that this is probably an underestimate. Okay, but, but this was a documented case. The one that actually will surprise you is the maximum number of offspring from a woman and this is a uh, South American woman who had 69 offspring. She had almost all twins and triplets and was pregnant almost every year. Uh, probably some medical abnormality here which led to multiple ovulations and she was very fertile. Um, <laughs> typically, 
the number would be hovering down more around 10 or 15, historically being a maximum. Okay. All right. Now, that's the next point I'm going to make. Okay. So here I have to introduce what we call um, reproductive skew. So, which basically is a concept that says these are average value, there's an average value of one to one, right? So in elephant seals, each female on average reproduces about every year or every other year. And there's not very much variation. Most females produce 10 to 15, you know, actually 8 to 10 or so offspring in their lifetime. But there's tremendous variation in males. Some males do very well, and most males do very poorly indeed. In fact, if you look at this, um, if I can find my notes, in elephant seals, 4% of the males sire 85% of the offspring. So there are a few beach masters, a few of these big males that have a harem of 20 or 30 females, and they're impregnating all of them. And there are a whole bunch of wimpy males running around on the periphery, and they never get the mate at all. Okay. Same thing is... is true in many, many animals. So this concept of reproductive skew is really important. It basically says that males have the capacity to fertilize the eggs of many, many females, but because of the ability to locate them and the necessity of competing with other males, uh, most males won't do very well at all, and a few will win big. There's another concept that I, I need to introduce here, and that's um, the idea of an operational sex ratio. We've been talking mostly about primary sex ratios, one male, one female, on average. But in fact, when these females are reproducing and not just ovulating, but actually now taking care of their offspring and not ovulating, they're not available to reproduce. Males, all things being equal, unless they are, are, are monogamous, don't take time out. They're always ready to reproduce. There may be a breeding season, uh, but at least during the breeding season, they're always ready to reproduce. So there are even fewer females per male to reproduce. This is what we call the operational sex ratio. So um, oftentimes there may be dozens or even hundreds of males all competing for the, the attention of one female who happens to be ovulating and is ready to reproduce. So that further exacerbates the reproductive skew. Okay. That's about all I want to say about, about that right now. If any, what? Operational sex ratio. There's a, there's a real a, a real primary sex ratio, and then there's what's actually available out there to mate with, which is the operational sex ratio. Okay, so next question I want to ask um, takes a look at why is it that in our society and in most animals that you would want to study, uh, the primary sex ratio is one male to one female. Okay. Species after species, if you look at the sex of individuals at birth, it's usually within a few percent one male to one female. Okay. Why? Okay, let me, Darwin was aware of this. He comments several times that by and large, species reproduce equal numbers of males and females, but he didn't ever bother to try to offer an explanation. He probably didn't have one. 
The first person who really delved into this and came up with, a again, a verbal model was R.A. Fisher, who we've heard about before. Okay. Fisher said, think of it this way. Let's say we have a species, and all things being equal, cost of producing individuals, there are 10 females produced for every one male. Okay? If that's the case, that one male leaves behind, this is a sexual species, this one male will on average leave behind 10 times as many offspring as each female. Okay? So if a mutant comes along and increases the proportion of males being produced, because those males are so much more valuable than females in terms of getting genes in the next generation, it will be strongly favored. You can flip the argument around the other way. Let's say there are 10 males and one female in a population. The one female, all of her eggs are going to get fertilized, but on average, each male will only get a tenth of those fertilizations. So he'll be one-tenth as valuable as a female. And a mutant that comes along and favors the production of more females will be strongly selected for, and the sex ratio will move to one-to-one. Does everybody get that argument? Okay? We can take the argument a little bit further and talk about not just the numbers of individuals that are produced, but actually how much it costs to produce an individual. So let's say it costs a female, a mother, twice as much to produce a male offspring as it does a female offspring. Say the males, this, let's say it's a deer, and the males um, are bigger in utero, and then after they uh, are born, they suckle more, grow faster, take more milk. So on average, we can say that males cost twice as much in terms of reproductive effort as a female. If that's the case, females can invest in, in various ways, but what the, will actually be stable is to produce twice as many females as males. So you put the same investment in, not, the same, not just trying to produce the same number of individuals. Is that clear? Okay. All right. Um, it's actually a, a kind of a neat study that goes along with this that I, I didn't talk about when we were discussing the evolution of eusociality, but I think I'll go back to it now. And this is some work that was done by Trivers and Hare. Trivers and Hare were, were worried about uh, social insects, the evolution of eusociality. And this was about the same time that Bob Trivers had come up with his idea of parental investment that we talked about a minute ago. And they came to the understanding or the realization that in social hymenoptera, and let's just worry about ants in this case, we have a haplodiploid system. And remember the sisters, the workers to their sisters they're taken care of, um, are much more closely related than sisters are to their brothers. In fact, they share 75% of their genes with their sisters. They share only 25% of their genes by descent with their brothers. Okay. So that means that in terms of getting uh, reproductives out into the next generation, sisters are far more valuable than brothers because you get three times as many of your genes into the next generation if you help rear sisters than if you rear brothers. Okay. That being the case, we would expect ants, workers, to 
produce more of their sister reproductives than they would male reproductives. That's not what mom wants. The queen is equally related to her sons and daughters. So she shares 50% of her alleles by descent with her daughters. She also shares 50% with her sons. So she should favor producing as many male reproductives as she does female reproductives. Now the problem is ant colonies, most ant colonies are huge. There's just one queen and there's not much she can do except just lay eggs. So she does what she what is right for her. She lays roughly 50% male eggs and 50% female eggs. Okay? In other words, she's fertilizing half of her eggs. Okay. But now the workers can take over and say, this is not what we want. We get more of our genes into the next generation if we favor sisters rather than brother, brothers so they can feed sisters more, take care of them better, and produce a greater number of, of queens rather than drones. Trivers and Hare said, okay, that's a theory. Does it work? And they went out and tried to test it. They looked at 25 species of ant. And they went in and they weighed the output of drones and queens from colonies of these different species. Now, because of the effort that's involved, you can't just count numbers. Queens are often bigger than males. So you have to kind of discount that. But they, they basically hypothesize that if the female workers are winning, the queens that are produced by the colony should outweigh the males three to one. If mom is winning, it should be one to one. In 22, 23 out of the 25 species they looked at, the ratio was roughly three to one queens to drones. In the two that did not fit, they were very small colonies, very, very few numbers, and the queens apparently were able to control the one to one sex ratio. Okay. All right. So we've talked a little bit about why the primary sex ratio is one to one. Sometimes exceptions can give us more insight to what's going on than looking at the primary examples. So we're going to look at five cases where the primary sex ratio is not one to one. These are specialized circumstances which favor some deviation from a one-to-one -one sex ratio. And the first one we're going to talk about is what's called local mate competition. Let's say we have a, a, a case where there's a lot of inbreeding and brothers and sisters are mating a lot with one another. If that's the case, a female would do better not to waste all of her reproductive effort or half of her reproductive effort on males, produce more daughters and fewer males. It only takes a few males to fertilize all of those females because it's the eggs that are limiting. So are there cases where we see examples of that? And obviously there are, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, one of the best known, <coughs> known examples occurs in a mite, um, a little arthropod, almost invisible to your eye. It's only about a millimeter across. Um, and I won't worry about the name. It's uh, Acrophenex. The important thing about this mite is it's viviparous. By viviparous, I mean it gives live birth. So it basically has a marsupium, a chamber, 
that its offspring develop in, they grow up inside of mom and they actually emerge as c complete reproductive adults. Okay? Now, a female has usually around 20 or 25 babies developing inside of her. And she can control whether those eggs are going to be fertilized or not, so whether they are male or female. And it turns out what she does is produce about 20 females and one male. The brother inseminates all of his sisters before they're born, and then they're born and come out. Now, the reason this doesn't go to a highly, completely inbred clonal system is that occasionally a female can mate um, after they've left mom and after they've emerged. But most mating takes place inside of mom. So this is this classic extreme local mate competition which produces a very skewed sex ratio, many females to one male. So another interesting uh, similar situation which occurs in a parasitoid wasp called uh, Nasonia. This is a, a little wasp species that makes its living parasitizing fly larvae. So a female goes out and finds a fly larvae um, and uses her ovipositor to drill in and lay eggs. If she's the first wasp to find this fly larvae, what she does is drill in and then put in um, two or three female eggs, a male egg, and then a whole bunch of female eggs. Now remember, this is a haplodiploid species, and the female can control whether she lays a fertilized egg or not by whether she opens a little valve which allows sperm to contact the egg as it passes down into the ovipositor. Okay? And you can actually, if you, I've seen movies of this, you can actually see the female as she opens that valve so they go, will make a little twitch as she's exposing the eggs to the sperm. Okay? So what she does is basically put in about 8% male eggs and about 92% female eggs because the male, the brother, is then going to fertilize his sisters inside of the larvae, or actually at that point the pupae, uh, before they emerge. Okay? What happens if you're the second moth or, or moth, wasp that comes along. So now you've got a larvae, a fly larvae, and it contains a whole bunch of females and a few males. This would be a great opportunity to put in some extra males because there's all those valuable females and very few males to compete with. And that's exactly what happens. If you have a second female that comes up, she sticks her ovipositor in and she has sense organs on the end of it that can detect the presence of other wasps, or at least their eggs. If she detects them, she pumps in several males and then goes back to putting in females. So she skews the ratio to more males to take advantage of all those females that are already present. Um, the next one I want to talk about is called local resource competition. This is actually fairly common. Um, and it, the one example I'll give you occurs in Galagos. Um, Anybody know what a Galago is? So an African primate, uh, very, very big eyes, they're called bush babies, commonly. Um, I actually had a bush baby years and years ago, which uh, I got in a very strange way. I was in the uh, Chicago airport coming through customs from London and there was a fuss going on uh, at the baggage counter. Um, a individual was found trying to smuggle in a, a baby Galago. 
had it inside of his shirt pocket. And um, customs agents found it. It had a broken leg, wasn't in very good shape. And um, I was young and brash and walked over and said, excuse me, can I help? I'm a biologist. And uh, uh, they actually, for reasons I will never understand, gave me the Galago. <laughs> I convinced them I could take care of it. I, I knew it was a primate, that's all I knew. Um, so I took it back uh, to Iowa where I was a graduate student, um, got some tongue depressors and splinted its leg and it always walked with a limp, but it was okay. I had the Galago for about six years. It was um, a very nice animal. Um, totally nocturnal, which hit my, my work habits at the time. And uh, it also loved crickets, and I was working on crickets, so I had lots of food for it. So I have a, I have a fond place in my heart for Galagos. Okay, so why, why are Galagos engaging in local resource competition? Basically, what happens is that they live in these, these family units where there is one female and then one male and sometimes a few other brothers hanging around. Typically, it's the females that um, would stay put and will compete for that territory. But there's usually, they live in one tree and there's usually only enough food, usually sticky sap gum, for, to support a female. So any extra females that come along are going to be wasted because they usually don't disperse. The males disperse, and there's always a chance that they'll find a new Galago troop somewhere else that maybe has lost its male or that they can insinuate themselves into it. So what we see, <coughs> see in Galagos is a primary sex ratio which is adjusted to favor males because they're the ones that can disperse and go out and maybe find more females. Um, there, there's very little chance if you produce more than one female uh, that she will be reproductive successful because she's just going to replace mom. There's just one female there per tree. Okay, we'll continue on with this next time.